are we witnessing the demise of the American church in a world where people are reporting on the shrinking of Christianity? Today we're going to talk about four things that will absolutely jumpstart your church's health and outreach. Stay tuned because we're going to talk about the Great Commission and your church's role in it. You know, the church in every generation is called to proclaim to the world how people can personally know the Lord Jesus Christ. Hi, Alex McFarland. So honored that you're watching the program today. And we're going to talk about the Great Commission, missions, evangelism. And at, at this point, even some believers sometimes say, oh, no, I don't want to have to talk to people about faith and open up these volatile issues, God and culture and sin and things like that. But you know, really, the fact that we've got a message and we've been called to go to, go to all the world and tell people something that can change their life for all of eternity, I mean, this is really a privilege and a great thing, not a burden. Now, I'm going to give you four four realities that we'll unpack. And if you as a Christian would personally take it to heart, or if your church would work on this and really think about these things, it, it will absolutely transform your Christian walk and frankly, your own personal outlook. And, and here are these points, and then I want to read a scripture. But the, the points are this, accept the mandate, understand the message develop your method and seize the moment. See, I, I think that news organizations like Fox News are reporting about the dramatic shrink of Christianity in America because we have maybe not accepted the mandate or we did once accept it, but now we've disobeyed, that we are to talk about Jesus Christ. We need to understand the message, and that's what all of our publishing and broadcasting and events have been helping tens of thousands of people do understand this message. Then we develop our own personal strategies and methods, and then we seize the moment. More about that in a, a little while, but let me share a couple of scriptures from the Word of God about evangelism. And I'll, I'll share one that you might not expect. It's from the Old Testament. In Psalm 87, very famously, speaking of God and the New Jerusalem, it says, Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. There's a hymn of that name. But it goes on, it's talking about God and his dwelling, and it says that in the city of God, Rahab and the Gentiles will be remembered. The idea that Rahab the harlot and Gentile non-Jewish nations could know the true and living God, that was revelatory back then. But it goes on, and it says, one day people will say, this one and that one was born in her, the city of God, when God records the names of his people. When God records the names of his people, will your name be one of those names? You know, it's going to be amazing that forever there'll be fellowship in heaven among those who who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's amazing is not only can we personally know Christ, but we are called to go into all the world and help others know Christ as well. Well, when we come back, we'll talk more about this with an expert on this subject and much more. Don't go away. Every daughter knows that her father is the most important man in her life. He is her first love. But her father doesn't know it because dads are maligned and marginalized today. Well, I have an answer for dads. My strong father's strong daughter's masterclass. It's a series of online videos I created to show fathers exactly what they can do 
to have better, closer relationships with their daughters. And men have told me that it's transformational in their relationships with their daughters. So no matter what your daughter's age, if you're a dad who needs encouragement and help, check out my Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters Masterclass. You can only find it on meekerparenting.com. Well, the Great Commission, perhaps you've heard that phrase. I know if you've been in church, you've heard about the Great Commission, missions, evangelism, the call of Jesus Christ that his followers go into all the world and tell the human race about salvation. Well, I'm so glad that we're back and we've got a friend that we haven't visited with in a long time, but a very valued colleague. His name is Don Shank. He's with a great ministry called The Tide. And for nearly eight decades, they've exemplified what the Bible tells the church to do, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And we're going to talk about not only what The Tide does, but really the state of missions in the 21st century. Don Shank, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be with you today and to share a little bit from our heart what the Tide Ministry is doing and to work with you to perhaps challenge people to really engage even deeper in the gate in the Great Commission. Well, you know, I think about a quote by John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Wesley was said to have uh, said this, that the church has, quote, nothing to do but the saving of souls. Now, given that, that this is our primary mission to go into all the world, proclaim the gospel, make disciples, uh, the the church has done that. But I would say the American church right now is not really as mission focused as, as I would like it to be, not as mission focused as the word of God tells us to be. What do you say? What, Don, what do you think is the current state of missions and, and world evangelization? I have to be careful here, Alex, because I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me. <laughs> well, yeah, but, I understand. You know, but I would say that um, in, in terms of engaging with the, the Tide Ministry, and, and I'm speaking for the Tide Ministry, I've talked to some other ministry leaders, and I think there's a, a bit of a similar environment. Many, many of our congregations in North America, as they grow larger, seem to become more internally focused. and there, there is a focus, and it's good to reach people in the local community where that congregation is. But Jesus, as you mentioned, you know, especially in Acts 1 8, where he, his last words were not just in Judea or Jerusalem, Judea, but to the ends of the earth. And I think that part kind of becomes a, a side program for many churches. Um, I've often said, I love to get invitations into churches where there's like the size maybe be 250 people or less because those are the congregations where I find they're still very focused on reaching even to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I know mega churches are getting involved, but they tend to want to create their own missions program and every mission program is good. If if there's something that's going to reach the rest of the world, I'm all for it, but, and I don't want to brag, but there are ministries like the Tide. We know what we're doing overseas. We have tried and trusted methods and strategies that get media in, put boots on the ground, follow up with listeners and plant churches to make disciples and have existing house churches and groups that are fellowshipping together and growing and reaching their own communities. Um, A large congregation might identify with something overseas, but let us help too and help us. Let us all be cooperating in this together. Well, give us a little backstory on the Tide and and your history and what you're presently doing. Okay. It started in 1946 in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. You know, World War II was over. Chambersburg was getting its first radio station. Imagine that. And there was a local minister whose congregation, he had, uh, he was widely known as a local evangelist, well-respected, 
And some people in the church said, hey, if you go on the air, we'll pay for the first year. So he did that. And it kind of grew reasonably here in North America. Then when Transworld Radio opened up and started broadcasting uh, internationally, his program went on. And they found that when they started to do it in the indigenous language, initially it was the translation. We don't translate anymore. But people responded more readily when they heard the gospel in their own language. Right, yeah. And so we have transitioned into, we no longer do that half hour, uh, old gospel tied hour radio program. Uh, we work with indigenous groups. We're helping them to produce and utilize their own broadcast media outreach. So we train them in how to produce the program, not just how to present the gospel on air, primarily through radio, but through some video. But then we also help them set up the discipleship structures so that they can follow up with listeners. So the media is the first volley out there. And okay. then boots on the ground go in to connect with listeners, to make disciples, to provide literature for those who can read so that it becomes a, a holistic kind of a program where the gospel is not just being put out on the air, but we're helping people to embrace it and to experience the new life in Christ that we know God intended for people. Don, how many countries are you in now? Currently, as far as active ministry partnerships, we're, I, I had said 13 at one point, we're actually down to 12 because Nigeria is now becoming a self-sustaining ministry. So we're not really actively partnering with them as much. Uh, but as far as our outreach, you know, we're working with a group out of Egypt and it's broadcasting over Sat7, which goes out across the whole uh, Middle East and North Africa. So it's hard to say how many countries are being reached there. Right. As okay. far as active wow. partnerships, uh, you know, where we're producing the program. So would you say the majority of your broadcasts are in the non-English speaking world? Yes. Yeah, they're basically, um, we still do some in Southern Africa. And mm -hmm. there it's interesting because our focus in the one studio is to produce Ndebele language broadcasting, some Shona language, but they're actually going back to also producing some English programming because North America um, exports a lot of media and it's not right. all Christian media. And right. young people, they may have been born into an Indivele household, but they grow up in the city and they grow up consuming media in English and they're, they're comfortable with English. Are, are you in, uh, forgive me, uh, are you in Europe or Great Britain? The only place we're in which uh, would be for, considered part of Europe would be Albania and Kosovo. That's kind of more Mediterranean, but not right. really Europe. Yeah. Well, you know, you and I both leading parachurch missions ministries, we're dependent on the prayers and support of Christians. Right. And if the tide is like Truth for a New Generation and Alex McFarland Ministries, you know, the vast majority of that comes from North America and the USA. And we're right. grateful, obviously. But that being said, what is your take on the state of the church in the USA right now? Re reason I asked, Don, is because there was an article that came out on Fox News just about three or four days ago. Lauren Green researched it, and she has sat right here and been on our show a couple of times. But the, the, what they reported on was, quote, the rapidly declining state of Christianity in America. Uh, what is your read on the spiritual state of our nation right now, Don? Alex, I think for me, it is heartbreaking that the rest of the world looks at the U.S. as a Christian nation. And what we are sending, the message that we are sending to the rest of the world of what, if, if they're looking at us as a nation, as this is Christianity, they're getting a wrong view. Right. They're not getting the truth. And I think the secular worldview has seriously invaded and impacted so much of the church in North America. And I think the gospel has been watered down. Truth yeah. has been compromised. Yeah. I think of, uh, 
a consequence of that is that even people here in North America find inconsistency and a lack of solid truth in the Christian faith. And so I think the, the church here is losing ground. And we're actually gaining ground faster in other countries, despite the negative uh, witness that the local church in North America has. Uh, what's a bigger challenge to the spread of the gospel, Don? External pressure from a lost world or a church that is not really in step with what the Word of God tells us to be? I think there's an incredible hunger, and it's, it's not, a, it's, it's tempting to say there's an incredible hunger in other countries, but the hunger exists here in the U.S. People want truth and they want something, a solid foundation. And I think the, the greatest hindrance to the spread of the gospel is if we don't give them the pure bread of life to eat. Mm -hmm. Meaning a, a, a clear proclamation of the gospel that Jesus died. A clear died proclamation of the gospel and standards of God's truth that we have to accept and live by regardless of what society says we should accept or what, what, what society tries to input onto us. We, we cannot mold, we, we, can, we can contextualize, this is what we do as a ministry. You know, we work with indigenous people to help them preach the gospel in their own language to their own people. So it's not seen as a foreign concept coming in, but that it is a, a God who understands them in their language, in their situation. But we're very careful to make sure that syncretization does not take place in that process that cultural elements that are not part of truth get blended in with Christianity. And I think here in North America, there has been an incredible amount of syncretization between secular worldview and Christianity. Don, uh, when, when I was in seminary now, almost 30 years ago, um, I, I had missions professors and they would say, well, the hardest people to reach are Muslims. It's almost like Muslims are inoculated against the gospel. But I, I would say in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years in North America, the, the secular world, uh, there was the rise of atheism back a few years ago. And we've debated right. some of the more well-known atheists. But uh, while a lot of the famous atheists are gone now. Secularism seems very strong, and especially like millennials and younger. In a way, I've almost, I've remembered my professor's statement about Muslims being inoculated against the gospel. It's almost like some of the millennials and younger seem to have gotten a similar inoculation. Here's my question. Um, when you've got people groups that just seem impervious to the gospel, what what does the church do, whether it be Muslims, atheists, or just secular, prosperous Westerners? What do you do when the your hearers seem to not be hearing? I think it comes back, Alex, to the fact that the hearers need to hear it from people of their own identity. Wow. And so I think I have met some incredibly dedicated and committed millennials and Gen Z, so the different, in the different groups. I think we need to, as the church in North America, we need to enable them and assist them and learn from them how to connect with their generation, how to get truth for, well, truth for a new generation. That, that's, that's what hey, it is. I like that. <laughs> Somebody ought to pick that up and run with it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, seriously though, Don, that that is that's a brilliant insight. And you know, thank God for Christians of all strata sharing Jesus. But you are right, um, whether it be uh, you know, people of you know, ethnic groups around the world or here in America, um, the best people to reach somebody is somebody of their own peer group, really, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. And and I think that's where we can best be of, of benefit to the kingdom by recognizing that we don't, 
we, we shouldn't tell younger generations, hey, wait till you grow up and then you'll understand and you can get involved. No, God can speak through children. And you know, we've seen this even in India where we have literacy training and children come to those classes and they learn scripture, they learn to read and write through scripture and religious material. They're carrying it back home and they're carrying the gospel into their homes and impacting their parents. Uh, I got one more question, and it's such a, okay. a privilege. Well, two more questions, really. One of which is, what is your website? Uh, Our website is you? yeah, thetide.org. Thetide.org. Thetide, the tide, yeah, T-H-E-T-I-D-E dot O-R-G. For anyone just tuning in, we're speaking with our longtime friend and colleague, Don Shank of The Tide. Uh, it was originally called The Gospel Tide, wasn't it, Don? Yes. Yeah, it was gospel. It, the, the first program was Gospel Tide Hour, and then it was we're we're still formally registered with the government as Gospel Tide Broadcasting Association. But and the Tide is our street name. The Tide dot org. So here's the question: What is the role of prayer in evangelism? Um, because you know, I've I've just found in my own Christian life and all of our work, things just go exponentially stronger when it's covered in prayer. So talk about the relationship, if you would, between prayer and, and world missions. Prayer is critical to world mission. And that's why you know, we have a prayer guide on our website. We, we encourage people to pray. And when, when people donate, you know, scripture says, you know, where, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So people are giving, they're gonna pray here and support. And I have had people, when I visited some of our partners overseas, one of the first things they express appreciation and gratitude for is not the financial support we're giving them and the other support, but the prayers that they are feeling as they are ministering. Because some of them go out and they are putting their lives on the line. They are risking persecution, risking martyrdom. martyrdom. And to know that there are people praying for them and are with them there spiritually in the, the realm of prayer is so incredibly encouraging for them and gives them strength. And God does honor our prayers and gives the strength that we ask for. Well, Don, I want to say thank you for being with us on the program today. Thank you for all that you and your staff and constituents are doing. And uh, let's Let's covenant together not only to pray for the world, but to pray for America as well, because we need the gospel too. Absolutely. Don Shank of the Tide, thanks for being with us. And uh, we're going to pull away right now. We're going to be right back after this brief break and talk more about evangelism and standing for truth, which our nation so desperately needs. Don't go away. I just returned from a conference at The Cove, and it was absolutely breathtaking in every way. The mountain views, the tranquil areas within the woods, and just being alone with God. Mornings spent watching the sunrise from a rocking chair with coffee in one hand and my Bible in the other. Evenings spent reflecting on the incredible spiritual teaching. It's the embodiment of peacefulness. Come and experience The Cove for yourself. Economist and author Brett Graff recently noted that materialistic people are the least satisfied of any group in life. Hi, Alex McFarland here. We're talking about the Great Commission. Every Christian has a role to play. Every church should make this the focus. And you know, at a time when people are very often depressed and unsatisfied and they're just seeking just something, Obviously, the number one thing is to know Christ and to have put your faith in the Lord and know that your sins are forgiven. And of course, that's our call to everybody to make sure that you have a relationship with the Lord. But as a Christian, listen, that thing that will drive you and satisfy you and just leave you fulfilled, something that stuff can't do. You can't spend your way to fulfillment. You can be a part of something that literally will count for eternity, the great commission of our Lord. And whether it's praying, whether it's organizing, teaching, being a cheerleader in your church, uh, like we said, you've got to accept 
the mandate and understand that God's assignment for you is to be a part of winning the world to Christ. And then understand the message how that Christ died for our sins and we are declared righteous if we believe in Him. And then develop your method. And this is so exciting because you personally, God can shape you or your church to do innovative things, creative things. And then finally, seize the moment. Whether it's talking to your neighbor across the backyard fence or just, you know, going for it and saying to that person you know, hey, can I tell you what it really means to have a relationship with with God? But we've got to do it. And church, uh, our website, alexmcfarland.com, we've got so much going on to help you in your walk and your witness be a part of what God is doing. God has a purpose to train you in what you're called to do. And I tell you, Karis Bible College is the place for that. Man, if you want a life change, come to Karis. Come on to Karis. You need to take a step of faith and start believing God for something big. God made every one of you for something special. The next two to three years could be the most powerful time of your life. You know, people have questions. The good news is the Bible has answers. And even for objections and really pushback on on the claims of Christianity, we can explain and even defend the faith. Hi, Alex McFarland here. I do want to recommend my book, The Ten Most Common Objections to Christianity and How to Effectively Answer Them. This book has a 12-week small group study guide in the back. A lot of people have used this for, you know, Sunday school and discipleship. And so if you go online, you'll find my books, but especially in terms of evangelism and reaching people with questions and objections, the 10 Most Common Objections book, we believe will help you. Well, our website is alexmcfarland.com. And I would ask to pray about giving, becoming a monthly partner as we are equipping the church to fulfill the Great Commission. Do you know for your gift of at least $25, I'm going to send you something unique, but you're going to love it. It's our peanut butter, all natural, smooth or crunchy. For your tax deductible gift of at least $25, we'll send you a jar of all natural peanut butter. For your gift of at least $40, we'll send you two jars of peanut butter, smooth and crunchy. You're going to love it. No chemicals, non-GMO peanuts. It's amazing. And by the way, please do go to the website, alexmcfarland.com, our rapidly growing youth outreach, viraltruth.com. The campus clubs are growing. We're having regular Zoom calls to train leaders around the country. So we want to partner together to tell our nation about the God that many have forgotten. So stand with us, and I thank you.